We good? Here we go. <clears throat> awesome, guys. Man, um, I'm a little winded, so I'm just letting you linger for a little while longer to catch my breath, you know, so there's that. Um, <clears throat> man, Keith, if it gets too hot in here, all you. The, the things on the wall right here. <laughs> Up here, <laughs> up there. I'm telling you all, so if it's a survival thing, you can just change it, okay? Um, good. So, man, I, I was worried it would be cold in here today, to be honest with you. And I told everybody, I said, listen, it's so cold, it'll be a light service, and so we don't have to worry about that. We won't heat it up too bad. Don't trust me, I am not a prophet, okay? <laughs> trust the word. Um, I'm fallible. Here we go. So, um, guys, there is, man, I'm trying to think. There is nothing sweeter, I think, on earth that we get experience right now, nothing sweeter than the presence of Jesus. Like, I, I truly believe that. I, I've been thinking this whole week about this, and I don't know if there's anything in my life. And I've got, I've got a, such a sweet life. I've got a beautiful family. I've got a loving, just amazing, incredible wife. I've got incredible children, five of them, Right? And, and they're, they're, truly, guys, they're wonderful children, right? My life is full. I've got a huge family. We just spent a week together um, in, a, in a cabin. I'm going to say cabin. And uh, <laughs> a beautiful place where we got to just celebrate our Christmas. We always move it out of Christmas because Christmas is crazy with church and stuff. So, and, and we had just a rich time together, you know. And I'm, I'm so blessed. I have so many beautiful things. I've been given so many good and gracious gifts and as I look at my life, I can honestly say there is nothing sweeter that I've experienced, that I've tasted, than the presence of Jesus. And church, sometimes we can come here, we can gather, we can have moments like we just had with the Lord, and we can kind of take that for granted. <laughs> kind of go like, wow, it's just, you know, every week we get to have this. Guys, I'm going to just encourage you today, don't take that for granted. Don't miss the beauty of what God is doing here through that. Um, one of our convictions as a church <clears throat> is that we wait on the Lord. Okay? Um, and what I mean by that is not just that we're waiting for him to tell us what to do, and we do do that, okay? But that we wait on his presence. That we're waiting on God to, to move and to, to do what he is calling us to do. But we're waiting on the Lord, and, and that's one of our convictions here um, and, and the reason it's a conviction is because it comes from the word of God. Um, in Exodus 33, following a grievous, the grievous sin affair of the golden calf scenario, I mean, you guys are familiar, familiar with that, right? Israel is supposed to worship God. They, they make a big calf and say, it jumped out of the fire at us. Woo, like a two-year-old's little fly, you know, this kind of thing. And um, after that, that moment, um, God told Moses that his presence would no longer go with them. In fact, he said to them um, that they could go into the promised land, that he would, in fact, send his angel before them to fight off the inhabitants of the land, that he was going to go before them to conquer and give it to them and hand it over. And he said, you can have it because I promised it, but I will not go with you. And Moses was devastated by that. So much so, and I just love Moses' heart. He actually goes before the Lord and he interceded on behalf of the people. He pleaded with God. And he says these words, verse 15. And Moses said to him, <clears throat> If your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? Is it not in your going with us so that we are distinct, I and your people, from every other people on the face of the earth? What Moses was praying is this, God, we would rather stay in the wilderness with no resources, with no housing, with little protection, with, with limited resources. We'd rather stay there where we're suffering than go into the promised land if you're not going in there with us. God, if you're not going, then it's not a blessing. That was Moses' heart. We would rather stay here where it's hot, where it's miserable, and where we're suffering because you are here in this place than go anywhere else without you. And let me tell you something, church, that's the same heartbeat of this house. We would rather sit in this hot, smelly room, <laughs> listen to me, and know that we're following the Lord, that his presence is with us, than take one step out from underneath his covering. Amen? 
Church, because the very presence of God is the thing that sets them apart from every other person on the planet, and it's the same for us today. Church, by God's grace, we won't take a step without the Lord's direct leading, no matter how much it looks like a blessing, no matter how many people tell us we should, unless God's hand is moving there with us. That's why we're still sitting in this room. And we'll be contented to sit in this room until God lifts his hand and says we're going this way. And we will gladly and celebratorily, if that's a word, go, okay? But church, when I think back over the last couple of years what God has been doing here, um, you, you might be new to worshiping with us. It might be you just kind of joined us here of late and you're trying to experience, you know, what's going on here and figure things out and that's all great. You might be wondering what's different, what's happening here. And, and as I've thought about that, you know, we, we have some pretty incredible things, yes. We get to come in before God's word every single week and just pour over it in a deep way. Praise the Lord for that. We get to worship Christ in just the beauty of who he is. We get to focus on that. Guys, we get to eat together. Come on now. Yeah, right? We get all these beautiful things. But as I think of what it is that makes what God is doing here so special, it's this reality right here, that the presence of God is resting on us. That's it. <laughs> That's the thing, guys. It's God's doing. It's not our doing. And church, that's what's so incredible. It has nothing to do with us and everything to do with him. Come on now. And so today, we're gonna talk about the presence of God through Jesus in his spirit. <laughs> Guys, we're going to see how the law of the Spirit sets us free from the condemnation of sin and death. We're going to see that God has given us the witness of the Spirit to prove that we belong to him. And finally, church, we're going to see that Christ's presence through his Spirit dwells with us in this place and in our lives. Are you guys ready for that today? Come on now. All right, then get on your feet. Grab your Bibles. Turn to Romans chapter 8. Church, we are turning... From last week, Romans chapter 7 to Romans chapter 8. <laughs> Praise God. Whew. If you don't have a Bible, as a reminder, there are Bibles up here. Come grab one. If you don't have a Bible at all, take one with you. It's your gift. We love nothing more than buying Bibles. And I mean that. Wipe us out. We'll buy more. Gladly. Okay? But you take them. They're yours. Okay? Here we go. Romans 8, verse 1. <clears throat> do not miss this first verse. There is, therefore, now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Come on now. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Praise the Lord, church. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, listen to what's condemned. He condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death. But to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. For it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God but he's talking to you, he's talking to me, and he says this, you, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If, in fact, the spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, 
Although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. And everybody said, amen. Amen. The word of the Lord. God, we come before you this morning in need of you. Lord, we want to hear your word. God, I don't want to just listen to it. As someone prayed this morning, I want to hear it. So God, I pray that the same spirit who's alive and at work in this house would be alive and at work in us right now in this moment. God, that your spirit would be here to illuminate the word to us so that we would see the truth of what you've written, God, the reality that is now ours in Jesus because of what you have done. God, I pray that the power of the Holy Spirit would just fall in this room right now. Lord, that you would fill me with the Spirit of God to be able to preach this word, to do just, just, just to do honor to your word. Would it be clear? Would it be transformational for us, God? Your word. Church, just pray over your own heart. Just receive from the Lord right now. Tell him to mold your heart, just soften the soil of your heart so you can hear pray over me as your pastor that God would just anoint my mouth to preach the word his word not mine we trust you God we trust you and we say yes and we lean in to your word in Jesus name we pray amen come on let's give the Lord a hand right now amen all right you guys can be seated all right here we go We're going to jump right on into this thing, guys. Um, 11 verses. Every time I've picked a section, I thought I picked it too long, and this is no exception. So here we go. Uh, We're going through 11 verses today in Jesus' name by God's grace, okay? All right, verse uh, 1. I'm going to read this paragraph, and then we're going to come back and kind of break it down. Uh, But there is, therefore now, say it with me, no condemnation, come on, for those who are in Christ Jesus. We're going to stop there, Yes? And praise the Lord, there's no condemnation for those who are in Jesus Christ. For, here's the reason why, the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. How? By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk, not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Church, um, we're going to break this text down. I want to teach this to you verse by verse, but it's going to be a little redundant because this whole thing is building on itself, okay? Are you okay with some redundancy today? All right. Uh, First of all, when you read this, you shouldn't sit here and be unmoved by what this just said to you. (laughs) Sometimes we we, we get so excited to come in, we just want to hear the word that we miss the impact the word is supposed to have. Do you remember what we read last week? Wretched man that I am, who can deliver me from this body of sin and death? For I do not do what I want to do. Instead, I do the thing I very hate, Paul says. And yet in this life, I'm still struggling with the flesh. We just read that, and then God says this. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Church, think about what Paul had said last week. We continue to battle the flesh. What, what Paul is struggling with is that while he has a desire for the Lord now that's been redeemed by God through salvation, at conversion, he believes in God, he wants to see God move in his life, that yet he's still battling what's called the flesh. And the flesh isn't his skin and bones, it's not his physical body. What is the flesh? The flesh is this ideological desire for that which is sinful, the part of him that still wants to sin. And if we're honest, many of us read that last week and we're like, "Uh uh-oh, he's reading my mail. (laughs) Yeah? That although I, guys, oh my gosh, I want to serve God with everything I have. Come on now. Devoted my life to him. And yet there's a part of me that still wants to go after these stupid things. I can call them stupid. 
these things that I hate in sin, my pride that creeps up into me that wants to take me out, these kind of things that I war against in my life. And, it, and here's the reality, church. We, we start to think, my gosh, if I'm still struggling with this, then maybe I don't actually belong to God. That because God just said in chapter 6 that he set me free from the dominion of sin, right? That I have the capacity now to choose to follow God. And yet here I am again and again choosing sin. And what starts to happen to us, it starts to become debilitating for the believer, doesn't it? Church, it can cause us to doubt our security in Jesus. There's nothing more. I've talked to many, many Christians. And the thing that causes them to doubt their salvation, you know what it is? It's that they continue to struggle with maybe a certain besetting sin. That I'm still, I haven't had victory here yet. And it starts to cause us to doubt the security we have in Jesus. Security, by the way, we're going to get to in the coming weeks. It causes us to doubt our election and if God has actually saved us. If his grace was sufficient for us. If he did what only he could do in us. And as we read this, Church, we become, we can start to become discouraged and our peace starts to fly out the window and we start to feel this one word here that Paul picks up on. We start to feel condemned. And that's why I said to you, do not miss the weightiness of what Paul has said right out of the gate when he says that there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Paul knows exactly what we're feeling. And church, that's where this verse holds unbelievable power because on the heels of chapter seven comes chapter eight. <laughs> on the heels of our struggle with sin, Paul launches this therefore. Church, that word therefore, he says there is therefore now. That's a linking word tying what Paul has said to this. And the question is how far back is he going? Right, what's he linking to? Just chapter seven or is he going back to chapter six? How about five? Anybody here for four? <laughs> we got a three and we got a two. Okay, I got a one right over here. What Paul is doing is he's tying back everything he said to this point. So there's uh, what's, we're on, let's see, we're on uh, week 18 of this series. Go back and watch the 17 messages before this. And everything Paul has been saying up until this point, he's building in this crescendo right here in this text where he's saying there is therefore now. And that now is significant because what he's saying is now through the cross, because of what Jesus did in this time frame, in this age of the church, there is now no longer condemnation for those who are in Jesus. Wow. And Paul is tying all the way back to the beginning of Romans. He's weaving an argument together that sounds something like this. I'm going to try to recap this for you in four paragraphs. Are you with me? Paul comes on the scene and says that God has the power to save through the gospel. And then he goes and describes what we're being saved from. What's the reality, church? That while God is the creator, amen? The creatures traded the creator for the creation in our worship, that we started to choose to worship the creation rather than the creator himself, who he says is blessed forever and ever. Amen. And then what happens is sin starts to take hold of our life, and we see the sin struggle start to move from bad to worse in our sexuality, in our worship, in our idolatry, in our legalism, that we start to continue in this sin pattern. Humanity utterly fails to keep the law. And we couldn't pay the price for our sin. We were helpless in our depravity. We didn't have the capacity to choose right. Therefore, all stood condemned before holy God, separated from him and his glory. That's the problem. Every man, woman, and child, because of sin, because of the sin of Adam, stands condemned before Jesus Christ. Yet, God did something incredible, didn't he? See, while humanity utterly and continually failed to live up to the righteous requirement of the law that God gave, a law, by the way, given for life and to restore and maintain relationship with God, he met the righteous requirement. God met the righteous requirement of the law through sending his perfect son, Jesus, our Savior. And it was through his sinless life, his death, and his resurrection that we now have life in him because God defeated sin and the power of death over the lives of of believers. Amen? And all that happens through faith. Faith. Church, then, 
as if that were not enough. God is still the one at work to continue his saving promises to those who are his. Church, first, God imputed Christ's righteousness. That is, he put the righteousness of Christ in our account so that he could actually declare us righteous in our justification before him so that we would be right before his throne. And then, even though we struggle with sin because of the flesh, he sent his spirit to will and to work within us so that we actually become more and more like Christ. That's called sanctification. So you have justification, you have sanctification, and God is empowering us to fulfill the law through his son, though imperfectly because of the spirit at work in us. And all of this means this church, that we will not fall condemned, but we will stand perfect before his throne. And all of this is his doing. (laughs) Come on, church. We just need to praise the Lord right now for that. Amen? Come on. There is no condemnation for those who are in Jesus. That condemnation is eternal separation from God through death in hell. And church, tell me, let me, let me tell you something today. If you are in Christ, that condemnation does not own you. It does not come near you. It has been condemned in Jesus Christ. Because, verse 2, for the law of the spirit of life What's it say here? Say it with me. Has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Church, when Paul uses the word law here, again, he's not using it in the forensic sense, talking about the law of Moses. He's using it um, to refer to a principle, that there's a new principle at work within you. The principle of the indwelling spirit who gives life has set us free from the principle of the law of sin, which leads to death. You with me? Church, by faith in Jesus... You have been transferred out from under the rule of sin, the dominion of sin, a kingdom of death, and into the rule of the spirit, which leads to life. So you see the the, the contrast he's making here, that once you were under sin, which leads to death, but now you are under the spirit, which leads to life. Think about the absolute dynamic shift of what has happened in your life because of Jesus. Sin was your master, it was your ruler, but now you're under a different ruler and his name is Jesus through the power of the spirit and he doesn't lead you to death, he leads you to life. And so the question you have to ask is how is that possible? Paul answers for you. Look at this, verse three. For, he's building an argument. Notice those, those words, he's linking this together. Therefore, because, for, right? You see that? He's making an argument for, here's why you're transferred out from the, from the principle of death into the principle of life. Look at this principle of the spirit. For God, who? For, say it with me. God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. Church, the law could not produce righteousness in us because it was weakened by the flesh. We read that last week, right? That sin, seizing an opportunity through the law, led us into more sin. That when the law came, the law that was supposed to bring life, sin saw as an opportunity to destroy us even more and took advantage, yes? And so the law could not lead us to what God had desired desired for it to lead us to. You with me? And so, and here's why. Because of the flesh. Yes? Because here's why. Our desire for sin outweighs our desire for God's righteousness when we are under the dominion of sin. That although we want to try to live right, we're going to continue to live in sin because that desire is stronger than our desire to live right when we are under the law. And because of that, we could not in and of ourselves keep the law. So Paul's been articulating for chapters. And so it says that God sent his son, Jesus. I want you to notice this phrase here. It says, in the likeness of sinful flesh. The likeness of sinful flesh means that Christ did not come with a sin nature. Hear me. 
He came in the flesh like the rest of mankind, but without a sin nature, causing him to sin like that of everyone else. And here's why. Because he didn't have an earthly father. He had a heavenly father, and he was conceived through the power of the Holy Spirit. See, church, the doctrine where we understand that Christ didn't have an earthly father is important because guess what? Sin is passed on to us from Adam. Paul's been making that argument, right? That from man comes the nature of sin, that through Adam, so we are all born with a sin nature. Well, Jesus is not born with a sin nature because he's not born of Adam. He's born of Eve, who was, was moved upon by the Holy Spirit of God to conceive, the Holy, to conceive Jesus in her womb, amen? So that he is without sin. But here's the reality, church. Think about this. Jesus came perfect and holy, Yes? But listen, in order to do what God had purposed, Jesus had to put on a body. Jesus was spirit ruling and reigning with God. He's always existed with the Father and the Spirit. But in order to come and accomplish the work of redemption, Christ humbled himself by taking on human flesh. He put himself in a body so he could come and conquer sin in his flesh, in his body. Do you catch that significance? And church, listen to me. Christ was raised in his body. He didn't just put on a body for this time period. He put on a body for eternity to come so he could save you and me. The humility of the Son doesn't stop at the cross. It continues for eternity so that God's plan of redemption could be carried out. Jesus put on a body so he could kill the body of sin. (laughs) And church, because Jesus bore the wrath of God, our condemnation on his physical body, on his flesh, he condemned sin in his body, meaning God accepted his sacrifice to cover the sins of those who believe in him for salvation. It is done. And all of this was done so that God can justify a sinner and say that he is righteous because Christ was. And then this was what happens out of that. So that in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, But according to the Spirit, church, Jesus' death and resurrection made it possible for two new realities. And number one is this, that we could be declared righteous because of the righteousness of Jesus. That's called justification. Because of Christ's death and his covering, we now can be declared righteous. Amen? That's number one. Number two, that we could actually, notice the text here, it says walk. That we could actually walk in a righteousness, though imperfect, that we could walk in a righteous manner through the power of the Holy Spirit as we actually become more like Christ. That's called sanctification. (laughs) That God is progressively making you more holy as you walk with him. Church, not only are you declared righteous, but through the Spirit's power and your cooperation, you are actually becoming more and more righteous in how you live. How many of you have experienced that in your life? That I'm not the same as I used to be. (laughs) Praise the Lord right? Like there's been transformation. I had someone come up to me and and tell me uh, over the last couple of years, they said to this person, I will leave them genderless, although they have a gender. (laughs) There's something different about you. You're actually changing. You know why? Because the Holy Spirit is sanctifying. Come on. The Holy Spirit is actually transforming. It's not just legalese, it's transformation, amen? God is not just saying you are righteous, he is making you that. Now listen, we know, Romans 7, we're not perfect, amen? But God is moving us on this path so that I'm not the same as I used to be. I'm not as broken as I once was. God has done something in me to redeem me, hallelujah. Come on now. Church, praise God for that because we don't say that God simply has power. We get experience that power. We get to see it in our own lives, the power of God to transform us, and it is amazing, and it is miraculous, church, and that's what he is able to do. So church, it says this, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled 
in us. The question is, what is the righteous requirement of the law? Church, when Jesus was asked what the single greatest commandment was, the single greatest one, you remember how he responds? Jesus doesn't respond by giving him one. Jesus gives him two, (laughs) okay? I love this. Because this is what he says right here, Matthew 22, 37 through 40. And he said to him, Jesus is saying to the one asking the question, what's the greatest commandment? Jesus says this, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first, the great and first commandment, yes? But 39, he goes on. And a second, what? Is like it. You know what that means? Is on equal standing with it. It's here. You can't pull them apart. And he says this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And he says this to really make sure you got that. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Church, what Jesus is doing is adding the two together to produce the fulfillment of the law and the prophets, which is what? Love. Church, to love God and love others is to fulfill the law of Christ. Galatians 6 talks about this, the fulfillment of the law of Christ. Christ came and fulfilled the law in its entirety through those commands by loving God and by loving others. Church, what the Spirit does in us is enable us to love. See, before the Spirit in us, here's the problem, church. We actually don't love God. We're, in fact, hostile to him. We'll see that in a minute. We are enemies of him. We do not love him. We despise him and his ways. So we look for other gods to love. And, in fact, we think that we have, we have the line on how to love others. Church, without the Holy Spirit of God, you do not have the capacity to love in a biblical, godly way. And yet, through the Spirit of God, he enables us, he empowers us to fulfill, though imperfectly, God's law as declared to us by Jesus. Because what happens in sanctification is we grow in loving God and in loving others. Sanctification leads you to loving the people God loves and loving him. Come on now. How many of you guys have seen that to be true of your life? Church, Jonathan Edwards says this. Our love to God enables, it enables us to overcome the difficulties that attend keeping God's command. Actually, loving God is how we fulfill the commands we can't fulfill on our own. That loving God gives us the power to overcome and actually to fulfill. Look at this, which shows that love is the main thing in saving faith, the life and power of it by which it produces great effects. Church, love is the main thing in saving faith. What God is doing in you is giving you the power to not only love others, but to love himself, and that through loving God comes a love that moves out to others, and that is to fulfill the law of Christ. Church, so, listen to me, God so loved you that he saved you so you could love him and others in return. (laughs) Think about that. God so loved you and me that he saved us to give us a capacity to love him and to love others in return. Church, what happens is God's spirit produces in us a love in our heart that ever increasingly moves us so that we become obedient to the spirit's law, that guiding principle. Church, here's the reality. To be a Christian is to be transformed from someone who loves themselves into someone who loves God and loves those who God loves. This is why, church, we take the one another so serious here. Because the measurement of your spirituality, the measurement of your sanctification rests on how well you love God and how well you love others. The question you need to ask yourself is, are you increasing in love of God and love of others? Because if you are, that's the Spirit's work in you. 
And all of this fulfills the law and prophets, Christ says. Church, this is the radical prophetic fulfillment of Ezekiel 36, 27 and Jeremiah 31, 33, where God said he would put my spirit within you and he would put my law within them and write it on their hearts. That prophetic reality was talking about now. <laughs> through the power of the Holy Spirit. This is real transformation. Now, you should ask yourself, what changed in me so that I can actually become righteous through loving God and loving others? Paul's gonna answer that for us, verse five. Here's the change. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. For it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Church, Paul is contrasting two ways of life that bear witness to our condition. These are, these are evidences of what is really going on inside of us, okay? These two realities tell you what kind of person you actually are, whether you're a person of the spirit or you're a person of the flesh. Look at, on the one hand, the person of the flesh um, is this person. It says that they live according to the flesh, yes? What is that? Action, right? What they do is congruent with the flesh. They're pursuing sin, and the deeds that they carry out are sinful continually. They're, they're operating under the flesh in the way that they live, but not only the way they live, because it says that they also set their minds on the things of the flesh. This is the way they think, yes? This is what drives them. What's their motivation? What they're after? What they're longing for all centers around things of the flesh. Again, flesh is what? Our desire for sin, yes? Everything they're doing is operating, trying to sin even more. The way they act, the way they think, which leads to, what's he say there? Death. Why? Because they are hostile to God. Um, the hostility, by the way, is shown by the rebellion to God's law and their inability to keep it. Why does it say they're hostile to God? Could there be a different word? Not submitted, re rebellious, right? There's other words, aren't there? It says they're hostile. Church, their inability to keep God's law comes from the fact that they hate God. <laughs> they might give lip service to God, okay? There are very spiritual people who are not filled with the spirit of life, who give lip service to God, who say they love him and are praying to an entirely different God because, in fact, they are hostile to the God of heaven. They are enemies with him, and because they are enemies, they cannot keep his law, and because they cannot keep his law, they do not have peace with God. Therefore, they cannot please him, which means they are not his, and they are condemned. But on the other hand is the person of the Spirit. Church, the person of the Spirit says they live according to the Spirit. What's that? Actions, <laughs> okay? The way they conduct their life, the things that they're doing, right, are in accordance with the Spirit. They set their minds on the things of the Spirit. What's that? Their thinking, yes. They're, the way they're operating, what they're dwelling on, what they're living into, what they're watching, what they're viewing, what they're allowing in their life comes from the Spirit. They want more of the Spirit, not less. And so they lean in, which reveals that they have life and, it says, peace. Notice that word. Not hostility, but peace. Not death, but life. And therefore, church, they are friends of God and have peace through him. They are no longer hostile to the ways of God, but they are friends with him, therefore having peace, church. And the important distinction we need to make between these two types, the one who's of the flesh and the one who's of the spirit, is this right here, church. That what Paul is writing here, 
bears witness not to what we do, but to who we are. When Paul is making these lists, he's not making a list of something you should go try to do. Well, by the way, you should go try to walk by the Spirit. He talks about that in Galatians, okay? So do that. But here in this context, in this passage, he's not telling you, hey, go out and walk by the Spirit. He's saying if you are of the Spirit, you will walk by Him. If you are of the flesh, you will walk by the flesh. What he's doing is he's throwing two witnesses at us to say this. Does your life reflect that of the flesh or does it reflect that of the Spirit? What is the witness of your life? What is the fruit coming out of who you are? Are you one who's walking in darkness, seeking sin, pursuing that with everything you have, trying to cover it up and just pay pretense to God? Or are you one who is filled with the Holy Spirit of God, living for him and trying to live, though imperfect? Romans 7. Are you trying to live in the Spirit, obeying him at his word, keeping what he's calling you to? It's evidence of what you really are, not just what you do. Are you with me? Church, walking by the Spirit, putting on the mind of the Spirit is the evidence that you belong to Jesus. Not the way to Jesus. So because of that, we're going to give you time at the end of this gathering to really dwell on these realities, to do some reflection, to see, am I one who's living by walking with the Spirit or by walking in the flesh? We want you to weigh that. I, listen to me, guys. I, I want every single one of you to walk out of this room today with peace and assurance that you belong to Jesus. But I can't give you peace and assurance that you belong to Jesus unless you actually do. And so God forbid we be self-deceived into thinking we're good with God when we're not. So we're gonna give you some time for that in a moment. But I want you to watch how Paul further explains what the evidence looks like when someone is living according to the Spirit. Look at this, verse nine. You... However, who's he talking to? Yeah, he's writing this to the Romans, yes? Who are the Romans? Just the whole city of Rome? Who's he writing this to? The church, amen. Yep, he's writing this to the church in Rome, right? So you, when he says you there, he's talking to those he believes are a part of the church, the gathered body, therefore they are believers in Jesus, yes? Yes? Now, Paul understands that there are those in the room who are not actually believers, but who think that they might be. Fair? Church, I preach to this. I preach to the church. I preach to you as though every single one of you is a believer, though I know some of you are not. But I preach to you so that every single one of you can bend the knee to Jesus. That's the goal. (laughs) And Paul's doing the same thing. He says this, you, however, are, what's he say there? Not in the flesh, But in the spirit, if you're a Christian, you're not in the flesh, you're in the spirit. If, he says, in fact, the spirit of God, look at the words here, dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. It does not get clearer than that, my friends. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, then he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Come on now. Church, the evidence that you are a believer in Jesus is the presence of the Spirit of God in your life. That is the evidence that you belong to Jesus. Church, those who have the Spirit are those who belong to Jesus. The Spirit is the sign and seal of your salvation in Jesus Christ. Come on now. Paul says clearly that those who do not have the Spirit do not belong to Christ. Church, this is why we understand in our theology that every person who is called by God and believes in Jesus Christ is filled with the Holy Spirit of God at conversion. Because the sign and seal of your genuine conversion is the reality of the Spirit dwelling in you. If you're not filled with the Spirit, you're not part of God. That's a significant issue. And so, church, we believe that every believer has the spirit the moment they cross from death to life, that God regenerates your spirit and gives you his spirit, and you are now one with him. Amen? 
So what does it mean then that the Spirit dwells in you? What's that mean? Guys, so often in our day and age, we're accustomed to talking about the work of the Spirit, and this is good. You should put your, your, your mind to this. This is a good exercise for you to understand what the Spirit does. But many people in our day focus on the Holy Spirit's promised power. Okay, um, you know that Acts 1.8 says that you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses, yes? That there's a power at work in us because of the Holy Spirit of God. How many of you guys have experienced that power in your life and walk with Jesus? Praise the Lord. We need that power, amen? It was promised to his church. We're part of his church. Therefore, we still have that power. Hallelujah. Church, listen to me. Um, others focus not on the power of the Holy Spirit so much, but on what the Holy Spirit is able to perform through us in gifts, yes? And so we start going after the gifts. We're, we're looking at everything God has given us. And listen, church, we believe in the gifts. We believe God has given us gifts to edify the body, to perform what he wants us to perform so his gospel can go forth. We believe that God does that. And some people focus on that as if that's the essence of the Holy Spirit's work, that his only job is to give you gifts or his only job is to give you power. And there's a third group and these are people who will point to the purification of the Spirit in the lives of believers, that the Spirit's job is to purify the bride. His work is to purify the church. His work is to work in you to make you more holy, to sanctify you. Can I get an amen? Is that his work? Power, performance, and purity. Yes? I gave you three Ps there. Come on now. Y'all are to lock that down. Is that his work? Yes, it is. Amen? But church, listen. I'm influenced by J.I. Packer, his conclusion that in this context, in this text, in Romans 8, it is the Holy Spirit's presence that is the essence of the Spirit's work in the lives of believers. So often we're after the power, the performance, and the purity, but listen, it's the presence of God that says you're mine. Church, look what the text says repeatedly. It uses the word dwell to describe our relationship to God's spirit dwell. In your Bibles, I want you to underline that. I want you to circle that several times. God uses that language in the spirit dwell in you, Christ in you, that the spirit dwells in you, that the spirit who dwells in you. In those short verses right there, that many times he keeps referring to the spirit dwelling in you. Church, dwell Dwelling is the language of intimacy. It's the language of presence. Um, how many of you guys dwell somewhere? I'm making assuming because you were not frostbitten and dead in a ditch. So <laughs> you dwell somewhere, yeah? What does it mean that you dwell somewhere? You live there, yes? Which means you have a, a bed there, right? You rest there. You sleep there. You cook your food. How many of you guys cook your own meals in your own house? You are rare, my friends. This is good, right? You're occupying that space. You're lingering there. When you dwell somewhere, you take up residence there. Are you with me? Church, people who dwell in houses plan to stay there a while, don't you? Especially on weather like this. <laughs> we linger. We hover there. We spend most of our time there. And the language of the Spirit dwelling or indwelling believers is the language, by the way, that Jesus uses to describe the closeness that he prayed for the night before he died. Check this out. In John 17, Jesus prays this. He says, I do not ask for these only. That's for those who are with him in his generation. Those are his disciples and his apostles. He's not praying only for them. Look who he's praying for. But also for those who will believe in me through their word. That's you and me, church. Come on now. The night before Jesus goes to the cross, that night when he's praying in anguish, he's not just praying for those with him. He's praying for you right now. And this is what he prays for you and what he prays for me. That they may all be one. Listen to that language. That they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us. Come on, church. So that the world may believe that you have sent me. People take this verse and they twist it out of context and they say it's talking about the oneness of the body. We got other texts for that, church. This ain't talking about the oneness of the body. This is talking about our oneness with God Almighty. 
that they, you and me, that we would be a part of God the same way, with the same intimate relationship, listen to me, as Jesus has with the Father. That's what Christ is praying for you. The night before he goes to the cross, church, the night before he's going to condemn sin in the flesh, the night before he's going to take the wrath of God on his body to make a way for you to have that kind of relationship, he prays that for you. And not only did he pray it, but he sent his Holy Spirit to ensure it. Church, God wants intimacy with you. The Holy Spirit dwelling in you is language of intimacy. It's proximity. It's that we are close, that he is near, that he's a part of us, that we're a part of him, that we are one with God through the power of the Holy Spirit, church. And his prayer wasn't that we'd be filled with power. Jesus' prayer wasn't that we'd exercise our gifts. It wasn't that we'd be pure, though Jesus talked about all of those things. The prayer the night before he dies, the, the, the prayer that's on his lips is that we would be filled with his presence. Church, through the spirit of Jesus, we become one with the Father and the Son and all of this is mediated through the presence of God's Holy Spirit at work in our lives. We now have new life because of the Spirit at work in us. We can have intimacy with God Almighty because of what the, because the work of the Son given through the Spirit of God in our lives, amen? And this is profound and this is incredible. Jesus' prayer isn't just that you're casually filled with the Spirit. Just a little bit. Church, Jesus' prayer is that the Spirit of God would move in and everything else would move out. And he's at work to do just that. And Paul presses this point by implicitly asking us to do some soul searching. Paul uses the word if three times in this passage, in those final verses. Three times. Church, the way he uses it <clears throat> as it's constructed in the Greek is assuming that the if is true of you. Paul's assuming, again, that you're believers and this is true for you, okay? But there's another layer at work here. By asking the question if, Paul is inviting you to examine your own heart and life to see if the Spirit of God, in fact, indwells you. And so this means this, church. You need to do some reflecting in your own heart to recognize does the presence of God dwell in you? Is God resting on your life? And so I have some questions here I want you to wrestle with. You can write these down in your notes pages. You can snap a picture of this. We're going to give you time even right now. But church, don't let this go by. The questions I want you to answer are this. Is the presence of Jesus resting on your life? All right? Are you sensing his work and his movement, his leading, his guidance, his, his direction for you? Are you sensing him resting on you? Do you know his presence is there with you? Can you see that and sense that? Is your mind filled with thoughts and motivations to follow the spirit or to follow yourself? Ask your question, ask yourself that question. Am I filled with a motivation that says, I want more of God and less of me. I want more of his word in my life. I want more of his spirit to move and to live and to breathe in me. I want less of me and myself. Come on now. Church, are you walking with the spirit or are you walking by your sin nature? When you get up in the morning, are you, are you seeking to follow or are you seeking to follow you? Do you sense the Holy Spirit at work in your life or are you living by your own strength? trying to do all this on your own? Or are you empowered by the Holy Spirit of God? Church, has the, soul, has the Holy Spirit of God taken up residence in your life? Can you look at your life and honestly say, God lives here. God dwells in this house. 
God is pleased to sit with me here in my bedroom and at my kitchen table and in my garage. He's with me. Has he taken up residence in your heart? Has he turned your affections to him? Has he taken up residence in your worldview, in your politics, in your way of thinking? Are you submitted to what God has for you? You don't care what you grew up with. You care what God is doing. I want to think my own thoughts. I want to think his thoughts. Is he taking up residence in your life? Church, is he resting on you? Do you set your mind on spiritual things? Do you consistently endeavor to live by the word? Because the spirit calls us to that. Are you asking God to show you his will for your life? Are you seeking his spirit to lead and guide you? Is that part of who you are? Then if that's so, church, then God is resting with you. He's resting on you. I want you to ask yourself these questions and I want you to discern. Ask the spirit to discern if the presence of God is resting on your life. Because if he's not, then those who do not have the spirit do not have life in Christ. They don't belong to him. And Paul doesn't say that to shame people who think they're saved and aren't. I don't tell you that in this church, this congregation, to try to shame you. I say that to you out of love for you because you can have the Holy Spirit of God resting on your life. Because if you look at your life and you recognize, man, I don't, I don't know that that's true of me. I think I'm actually walking more by the flesh. I think I'm living in the mindset of the flesh. I think I'm following me, not following the Lord. If that's true for you, and you, you search this out and you come to that realization, I want you to come talk to me because I believe that God is showing you that so he can save you. <laughs> so he can seal you for the day of redemption, so he can fill you with the Holy Spirit so that your life is not no longer alone, but filled with the presence of God Almighty. Friends, the spirit of Jesus is resting on this church. (laughs) The presence of the spirit is what fills me with assurance that we are indeed following Christ. (laughs) that he's pleased to dwell here. Church, the spirit of God resting over this house is what makes everything here so transformational and powerful. It's him. Think about that. God is resting here. It's one of the things that brings me to tears most often is just thinking of that reality. So ask yourself this, is God resting in your house? Okay, I'm gonna give you time now with the Lord to pray and to to do some searching. David prayed, God, search me and know me. See if there be any wickedness in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Ask the Holy Spirit to search your heart now. Holy Spirit of the living God, we call on you this morning. opening our lives, God, inviting you in for more, Lord Jesus. God, we don't want to be satisfied with just a taste, Lord. We want to plunge into the depths of the the great river of the presence of God, Lord. I'm praying for my brothers and sisters in this room that they would just sense so strongly the presence of God resting on them. see you everywhere they go, everything they put their mind to, Lord Jesus, when they think and what they do, Lord, they recognize that, man, this isn't them, this isn't something from within them, they, they didn't think this way a year ago, they didn't move this way a year ago, but now suddenly there's been a change in their life, and when they believed in Jesus, when you called their name, God, that the Spirit started to work in their life to transform them and make them more like your son pray just for an awareness of that and a trust of that, God, an assurance given to us because where the spirit of the Lord is, there is life and there is peace. God, in the beginning of this 
chapter, you said there is no condemnation for those who are in Jesus. The last verse of this chapter says, what then can separate us from the love of Christ Jesus in God our Father? And the answer is nothing. There is now no longer condemnation. There is no longer separation because you have given the spirit of life to set us free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. And so we praise you. We're gonna sing to you. We're gonna lift your name high. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen? All right, church, let's close by singing today.